Dr. Vaughn, could you please um, walk us through the anatomy of your typical MSC surgical install? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm really happy to be here. I've been watching uh, the series here with you and Dr. Ting, and it's been impressive. And I have to say that uh, I'm really impressed with your level of knowledge. I discussed with Dr. Ting, like, what is his background? Because it's like you're, he has very uh, insightful questions, and you seem very knowledgeable on the subject. So I'm, I'm happy to be here with both of you. Um, to answer your question, uh, actually, I, I have pictures. Can I can I do a screen share and show those? Or yeah, go ahead and try. And if it doesn't look okay. good, and then I'll tell you, and we'll back out of it. Yeah, just cut it out. Of it. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, well, first of all, I also want to say that uh, Dr. Tang, I, I know you remember uh, it had to be over 10 years ago. We did our, our, our SARP, our first SARP case together, which is um, the surgical assisted rapid palatal expansion. And uh, that's basically um, when Dr. Ting was discussing that he was having some trouble expanding, you know, older males and, uh, you know, bigger guys. Uh, it's basically drawing from the anatomy of the SARP that I said, hey, maybe we could do these kinds of cuts for the MSC to, uh, to aid in uh, the expansion. Let me see if I can do a screen share here. All right, so this is a uh, picture from a skull. This is not mine, it's taken from a textbook. Um, but basically it depicts the areas of resistance for expansion. Uh, of course, outside of the mid palatal suture. So um, we, of course, want to release the palate, but especially for men and, uh, you know, adults, uh, we have a, a point of resistance at what we call the zygomatical maxillary buttress. And here at the piriform rim of the nose, the nasal maxillary buttress. So basically, um, taking from the SARP literature, we make a cut that releases the zygomatical maxillary buttress and it releases the nasal maxillary buttress right here at the piriform rib. Then we also make an incision. I have another picture here that'll go to it. Okay. It also kind of outlines the cuts. Um, we also make a mid maxillary vertical incision here and we then use that incision to gain access to the palate. So we then drive a chisel uh, posteriorly to uh, disengage the mid palatal suture. I see. So when you say so, when you say incision, you mean, of course, you're getting access to the bone by cutting the gum, but then you're also cutting the bone along those red lines that you were just showing. Yes. Okay. And Dr. Ting was saying something about multiple layers of bone uh, there sort of under the cheeks. And he was saying that only one of the layers was cut. Is that correct or is it? So um, I, I, I was listening to that and uh, it, it is true from the standpoint that we're not doing a complete maxillary down fracture as you guys were describing. You remember you had your skull and you were holding it up. Uh, we're not taking the maxilla and making it so cut that it can come down like a denture when we move it all around. So it's not a complete sectioning of the maxilla. However, the bone that we are cutting, we are doing basically bicortical cuts. We are at the zygomatical maxillary buttress. We are going full thickness through the bone uh, to release that, uh, that point of resistance. Okay. And are there, and you, you mentioned that you kind of, invented this this procedure uh, for the MSE install. Are, are there other surgeons doing the exact procedure or is yours uh, unique and other surgeons do different MSE install procedures? Could you talk a little bit about the different approaches someone might take to this same surgery? Absolutely. So first, I, I just want to say that I do not claim any kind of uh, invention of this procedure. Again, I, uh, I am taking uh, from data over 100 years old <laughs> to uh, 
to apply this to MSE. Basically, um, descriptions of max area expansion have gone back a century. And we, as surgeons, have built on the success and the failures to get to where we are now. So basically, uh, the surgical assisted MSE marries two uh, techniques that we use in oral surgery uh, to expand bone. Uh, one is the, uh, the cuts that we would use for a surgical assisted rapid palatal expansion and distraction osteogenesis. So really what we're doing is a modified SARP and using a distraction osteogenesis device to create the expansion. So the difference between the two is Dr. Ting has already pointed out, well, one is a tooth borne or tooth supported expansion. And the other is a bone borne expander. So one, uh, attaches to the teeth and it relies on the teeth to create the anchorage to expand the maxilla, whereas the MSC or a distraction osteogenesis device, uh, we actually screw uh, pads or anchorage devices into the bone and that is the primary stability given to expand the maxilla. I see. So, um, I didn't fully understand what you were saying, so let me go ahead and ask yeah. this. How yeah. is how is um, how would what you guys do be different than a SARP procedure? SARP, by the way, for the audience is surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion. It would be, you know, you go in for a double jaw surgery, you're put under general anesthesia, you know, you go, you fall asleep, you wake up, and all your expansion is complete in a matter of hours versus the MSE, which is a multi-month slow distraction osteogenesis process. So, could you just Talk about how the two are different. Okay. Yes, I'd like to uh, make a point of clarification here. Uh, almost what you're describing with going into the hospital, going to sleep, is a uh, more of what we call a segmental before osteotomy. Now, that's where you would go in, you would make uh, cuts in the maxilla, similar to how you and Dr. Ting described when you make the maxilla like a denture and you would actually segment the maxilla, and then you would spread apart those segments. You would plate them in that spread apart position. Is that, so that way you get the expansion right then and there at the time of surgery. Now a SARP uh, contrasting uh, is a procedure that can be done in the office. It can also be done in the OR, depending on the uh, cuts that you are making. But a SARP also uh, relies on the principle of expanding over time. So I'd like to make the distinction between a segmental before osteotomy, a SARP, and a surgically assisted MSE. I can even add on to that just the MSE. And you're going to edit this, right? Because this can get a little bit wordy. I just, I don't want to get too wonky here. But Please let it all out because I'm really enjoying what you're saying so far. Okay, thank you. So again, the, the segmental for hospital-based procedure, you're going in, you're making cuts to down fracture the maxilla. We'll call it the denture maxilla. You can move it around and you can even take that denture maxilla and cut it into multiple segments. You can then spread those segments apart. So when you wake up from your segmental report, you're going to already be spread into the positions that are desired and planned by the surgeon, and you are going to have plates and screws in most cases. I don't know anybody who's using wires anymore. Uh, you're going to have plates and screws to hold those segments into position. Segmental report. Let's step it to a SARP. Now, a surgical assisted rapid palatal expansion, you're going in, you're making cuts similar to the before, okay? The little segmental before. Uh, but in this case, you're doing fewer cuts. Your desire is not to have the maxilla completely down fracture. You do not want the denture maxilla here. So ideally, your patient will not leave with plates and screws to hold segments together, 
okay? Um, so we make those cuts, we release those areas of resistance uh, as depicted on that skull that we had shown earlier. And then you have a tooth borne device that the surgeon would activate to initially see the split. And then the patient goes home and they continue to turn it very similar to the MSC. Okay. Now with the SARP, as it's described in some textbooks, you do some releases that can put you at a higher risk for bleeding. So a lot of people don't want to do those types of cuts in an office-based setting. Okay. So a SARP where it releases back where the maxillary artery would be, back where we call the pterygo maxillary junction, and releasing the nasal septum, I feel, in my opinion, is best done in a hospital setting. Okay, so that's the start. And again, I don't want to get too wonky here. Let's move to the MSE, the surgical assisted MSE. There, we do cuts that are used with the SARP, but we then take away those cuts that are most risky for bleeding. So that way, a surgically assisted MSC can be something uh, that is done safely in an office. So we do not release the pterygo maxillary junction, and we do not release the nasal septum. Also, with uh, the MSC surgical assist, the incisions that we make are smaller. The SARP incisions can create an incision that clearly goes all around <laughs> the maxilla, it's one very large incision. With the MSE, we make three small incisions and to dissect, and we don't have to um, reflect as much of a flap to gain access. So it's, it's a less invasive procedure. At the, at the same time, you also get some more nasal cavity expansion because you, it's not, the maxilla is not completely loose. Right, exactly. So what's nice about that is, um, and, and I, again, your questions are very insightful. You, on the list of questions, we we're going to talk about the dome procedure. Um, you do get that base of the floor or the floor of the nose expansion so that you can take basically laterally release the lateral nasal walls from the structures of the mesial or the medial nasal wall and you can actually get increased airway volume and less, air, less airway resistance when you breathe. Um, so again, similar to the SARP, you get the gap at the time of surgery, and then the patient goes home, and they continue to make turns and uh, to the desired width uh, per the orthodox. And then the last one, the fourth one, uh, is MSEs, as Ting has done, hundreds of these where you place the device, um, the, the bone borne device and the patient, uh, either they are of a lower skeletal maturity or a lower skeletal density that the device itself can then create the expansion. 